Romance at a glance. Uh huh. Romance at a glance. What you say? Romance at a glance. Go ahead, girl. Hello and welcome to Romance at a Glance. Today is a special day because we have a very special guest, Tony from Lit Wallflowers Podcast. Hello, Tony. How you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm good, actually. I'm nervous. I'm nervous, but I'm excited. Listen, and, um, <laughs> nervous too, okay? I'm with you. I was like, oh my God, it's like our first uh, podcast guest and we've been wanting to do a collaboration with you guys for a long time. So we're yeah. like super stoked so it's, kind of, it's, it's nice that it's kind of a double because then we have Bridget coming on to ours too right yes In a which bit, so. she's very excited about and I think she's gonna do some sort of running commentary uh, like a backseat drive on this podcast maybe for <laughs> Patreon or something else uh-huh. because uh, I already I can hear her in my head she's gonna be like but what about this but what about that but did you, like okay I know you said this but <laughs> So I really, I'm actually excited to see whatever she says later on. Um, but Bridget has, in all, like in all honesty, when we read a book, I think she has way more thoughts about the book than I do in general. So um, Wendy's the same. So she just pops up like certain things. I'm like, how did you remember that? I'm there just thinking. I, I want to make sure that I'm using the right words. I'm quoting it correctly, and you know, the thought just like leaves my head. <laughs> so. I think we might be the same person, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> so wait a minute. Okay, so this is actually kind of funny because I, you and I are very similar. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering if Wendy and Bridget are, are very similar. So they're po- this might be a really chill podcast today. Yeah. And theirs might just be like a ready, set, go. <laughs> I think so. Uh, when I was listening to your folks' episodes, I'm like, and you guys brought that up, right? How you are a little bit more like... Um, I don't want to say reserved, but um, you did mention that Bridget has like all of these things that she remembers and she brings out. I'm like, that's exactly how Wendy is. Yes. <laughs> I would so say it's going to be interesting. It's going to be I'm, good. I'm laid back, and Bridget is uh, is much more of a go getter. Also, Bridget mm-hmm. can talk about anything, any topic to anyone at any time with no like no thinking involved. For me, my brain stutters out. It's like uh, 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 uh. Bridget, she doesn't have that problem she just goes all around same awesome okay so this is gonna be a chill podcast um anything goes you know you can uh say anything because we do say anything yes and um i'm very excited about this so all right tony we are talking lord of scoundrels today tony from the lit wallflowers podcast are you ready to get it popping girl yes (laughs) let's get it popping romance at a glance. Uh huh. Romance. At a glance. What you say now? Romance. At a glance. Go ahead, girl. All right, romance besties. We are talking Lord of Scoundrels today with our special, special guest, Tony from Lit Wallflowers Podcast. And we're very excited. I think we're going to have a very chill, laid back podcast today. <laughs> real vibey, you know, real study and chill type music type podcast. Um, so let's talk about this. It's Lord of Scoundrels. The author is Loretta Chase. Um, the audio, which I listened to, was by mm-hmm. Kate Reading. Um, and this book is sort of part, it's a standalone, but there is another book that has uh, uses these same characters as a part of the other book. And we are also in historical romance. Um, so, Tony, first of all, I have a question. Just yes. a little offbeat. Do you ever listen to audiobooks or do you only listen or do you only read <laughs> physical copies or Kindle copies? I do listen to audio. Uh, I I try listening to somebody else, just one person, and they said, I can't do this. Like they can't do the male voice right. <laughs> so I stopped. And the only person um, that does audio that I can listen to is her name is Rosalind Landor. Oh, and yeah, she does people. a lot of Lisa Clay passes books. Yeah. She's the only one I can actually listen to because her male voices are passable enough for me. So I do I'm, listen to them. I just, uh, I need to be a little bit more open because I, I need the extra time to like do stuff. If I can yes. do audio, I have a, a, other times, like then I have extra time to do stuff. So I'm with you. So we just listened to Rosalind Landor on mm. uh, Lisa Claypass's uh, Devil in Winter, which is yes. the last um, 
podcast that we put out. Yeah. That was a really good book. Um, and that was, yeah, I just listened to your episode. Like I didn't, I didn't finish it. I'm sorry, but I did like listen to a good chunk of it. Our episodes are mad <laughs> long. What was that? Like, <laughs> this one you, was, <laughs> this the time. One was, and I'm like, okay, there's a lot to talk about though. So there, that was a thing that I, when we started, I was like, okay, Bridget, let's try to keep this short. But also because my partner was like sitting out in the car and yeah. uh, we couldn't keep it short because mm-hmm. like, and I cut out a huge chunk of that really? episode. I did. We went on tangent, on tangent, on tangent. Um, and it still came out that long. So I'm like, if people make it halfway through the podcast, I'm like winning, hashtag winning. <laughs> no, I liked what I listened to. I'm like, I have to go listen to the rest of it, but... <laughs> I will. I will. Like, I, I like that book. So I, I want to listen to what you guys actually said about it. Nice. Well, this uh, book, Lord of Scoundrels, um, was the audio was done by Kate Reading, which mm-hmm. I think is what? It's an appropriate narrator name. Um, <laughs> she, does, <laughs> she does a phenomenal job, actually, doing the male voices. And that's really, I think, where I judge a narrator is like, can they do the opposite sex voices well? Right. Or, like, I will also accept, don't do anybody's voice at all. Like, keep it, like, a straight reading. And I will also accept that, like, as a good... Like, monotone. Like, um, I, I listen to those kinds of things, too, when it's just, like, a robot. There's a word for it. I just can't think of it right oh, now. Do you, do you listen to, the like, the electronically made yeah. ones? Yeah! Ah, the, okay, so that is... Because then, like, you can interpret the voices the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> From the book. So, so uh, my homegirl that I grew up reading romance novels with, shout yeah. out Vanessa. She's probably going to listen to this podcast because she listens to the podcast and then furiously texts me all her thoughts and feelings <laughs> about said book um, and whether she agrees with me or not. Um, but she writes BTS smut uh, mm-hmm. on Twitter. Mm. And she was talking about putting it into audio format. So the next time I saw her, she did. And she had me listen to it. And it was the electronic, like, uh, voice reading the whole thing. Yeah. And I was like, this is so crazy. Like, my brain cannot, because the cadence is weird when a computer's uh-huh. reading it, my brain could not, like, process the sound. And she's like, it's good, right? And I was like, it's a start. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for that, then I would listen to, like, actual somebody's. Yeah. Just <laughs> headphones on, right? Headphones on. Headphones on. <laughs> If you're listening to this podcast, headphones on. Uh, yes. We are not for children. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have a question for you. I don't know. So I have found that this book has three different covers that I could find. Oh, okay. I, don't, I don't know what cover you have, um, but I'm curious to know what you thought about the, the cover the art. Covers. So I have two covers. The newest one, the one you guys showed on like Instagram. Mm-hmm. So I think that one's really cute. It's really, it's a little bit more romantic. Just, it's cute. It's nice. It's pretty. But I do have the the vintage one with the couple on it. Mm-hmm. And I love vintage stuff anyway. And I like that one because it kind of has her hair cascading all around her. And, and it's exactly what it's described on the book where it's like black and silky and soft. So I actually really like, the vintage looking one because yeah. I think it's the colors are different yeah the colors are different so it really is to each his own nice so I had the so I pulled up all three covers so I could be prepared for this mm-hmm. podcast. um so Bridget wouldn't talk shit about me <laughs> <laughs> so the vintage one I think I I like that cover purely for nostalgia like because coming up reading romance novels that was like what a lot of them look like. They either look like a painted like landscape uh-huh. or they look or they look like, you know, the girl on the cover and the man no shirt thrown back. Fabio. You know, the Fabio, Fabio ones. Yes, the Fabio <laughs> ones. You know, like I didn't even know Fabio was like a real person because I'd seen him on romance <laughs> novels. And then when I saw him in real life, I was like, oh my gosh, that's not just like a painting of you somebody. saw him in real life? <gasps> yes. I actually look crazy enough met Fabio even though like he will never remember me as a blip, <laughs> blip in his life or whatever. But like I was at like a same event thing and I said like two words to Fabio and I was very excited about this. And <laughs> and honestly, like he was older. I mean, because obviously he was Fabio, but he still looked good. Like he was still- He still has that 
physique, mm-hmm. right? He's got the physique. And I was like, I like an older man. Like, Fabio could get it. Like, he could lift me. <laughs> Honestly, I have my, my, my one requirement for if they can get it is if they can lift me. Like, can you lift Same. me? Same. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all of so, this 150 plus <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I'm saying that's what I'm saying 150 <laughs> plus and not fall over and not be out of breath and not be like <gasps> yeah so it's funny like I, I kind of like stopped a little bit when they mentioned that in this book I'm like that's important <laughs> that's important that's really important <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so then we have two other covers. One is um, the very romantic. It's the girl. Um, there's a landscape. It looks like there's a guy in the far distance mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, it's interesting because then the other cover is of the guy, and it's a looks like a much more modern cover, um, mm-hmm. even with the font that they're using. And then it's just um, a man's body from the neck down. The nice jacket. Um, the funniest part is it took me a while to realize he wasn't wearing white gloves. He's just that pale in the cover. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's, oh. His, that's his hand <laughs> color. <laughs> I thought he was wearing gloves this whole time. <laughs> it was way sexier in my mind when he was wearing white gloves. And then, <laughs> then I was like, oh, he just hasn't been in the sun. I get it. Uh, <laughs> very British. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's interesting, the choice. So there's a cover with the two of them and then a cover of just her really as the emphasis and then a cover of him with the soft background. I enjoy all of these covers. I don't know if any of them actually tell you anything about the story whatsoever, but I would say the the cover with him is probably the closest to me for like getting the feel of the story because uh, he, to me, he's like the emphasis of the story. You start the story with his background um, how he grew up and that sort of thing. So I would probably say that the the one of just him is my favorite, like mm. overall. I need to go look for that. It's kind it of sexy. Like, yeah, it sounds sexy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a man in a suit. You'll say it. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let me give a, a brief synopsis um, for our romance besties out there. Tough-minded Jessica Trent's sole intention is to free her nitwit brother from the destructive influence of Sebastian Ballister, the notorious Marquis of Dane. She never expects to desire the arrogant, amoral cad, and when Dane's reciprocal passions place them in a scandalous, compromising, and public position, Jessica is left with no choice but to seek satisfaction. Lord of Scoundrels, Damn the minx for tempting him, kissing him, and then forcing him to salvage her reputation. Lord Dane can't wait to put the infuriating blue stocking in her place and in some amorous positions. And if that means marriage, so be it. Though Sebastian is less than certain he can continue to remain aloof and steal his heart to the sensuous, headstrong lady's considerable charms. Ooh. That's gone sexy. That's gone sexy. All right, Tony. Uh, so you got we got Jessica, we got Lord Dane, who's Sebastian, Bertie, her brother, who I thought was funny. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that uh, Bridget and I always kind of talk about is uh, how much backstory is crucial to a book, like for the reader to know in order to enjoy the book. And sometimes authors front load it. Um, sometimes it's warranted or not. How did you feel about learning about Sebastian's like beginnings at the beginning of the book? I have mixed feelings about this one. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, and, tell me, Tony. And I will say maybe, no, I was not tired at that time, but I thought the prologue was a little bit too long, but at the same time, it was necessary to know all of that so we could understand like his, how he evolves afterwards. But yeah, I, I'm not going to back down on that one. It, it was a little bit too long for me. So um, it could have, you know, in the story, like it does bring out some background things about like women and whatnot. I actually understand what you're saying in terms of like, sometimes when you're reading a book and you have a certain like mood or motion or tired or whatever, that mm-hmm. it affects the way you kind of, uh, feel about said book I find that sometimes I'm like I think I might be too hard on this book just because I'm stressed out like just in life I'm just like stressed out I might be a little too harsh on this book um I'm not sure if that's true or not because I haven't done a litmus test here but (laughs) 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 but I do understand that um so dear listeners uh, the beginning of the book 
starts with Sebastian um, being, a, well, it even starts before that. It starts talking about Sebastian's dad and it kind of gives you the landscape of who he is. He's kind of a bastard. Um, he ends up marrying Sebastian's mom, who he thinks is going to be docile and that he can, you know, basically control. And she turns out to be not a woman he can control. And he describes her as doing her own thing, basically. And then she <laughs> she takes a lover and and runs away. And the dad basically tells Sebastian that his wife, his that his mom abandoned him, and then later delivers the news that she died um, in a way that is not compassionate to an eight year old. Um, so Sebastian gets kind of scarred from this. His, his treatment of women is affected by this. Um, also, the in the book he he seems to emotionally get stunted at about eight years old. Um, you can talk a little bit more about that later, mm-hmm. um, but that's kind of how the book opens. And it does take uh, a little bit of time to get through that. Um, and there was a moment where I was like, is this still going? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Count the pages, right? Count the pages, yeah. you know. But, but I will say that it did add to the book. Um, and later on, I was like, okay, it was worth putting in that, that work. But I definitely had a moment where I was like, how much backstory do we need to know that he is uh, a tormented you know, youth who, who can't mm-hmm. love because his half Italian mom was too spicy, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, so yeah, so I totally, uh, I totally agree with you in that it, it, it could have been slightly shorter. Pretty much till the end, it used up certain things that you needed to go back to the prologue for. Yeah, that so, is, that is, that is true. So this, you, this prologue is worth it for it the is worth entire it. book. <laughs> that, I did not, this book did not lose points. And we've been reading so many books and I don't know how it is for you, but doing the podcast, we're like consistently reading books. And then in the meantime, I mean, Bridget reads way more than I do, but I've gotten really tired of books with really one dimensional characters. Uh-huh. And so I'm a little bit more willing and forgiving to have a bit of a more backstory. If I can get a character that I can really like, you know, deeply feel and get into. I don't know how, how you guys how are. How you can see that character like that. Yeah. How, how you can see that character growing mm-hmm. um, throughout the book and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm willing, I'm like, I'll, I'll take this pro, extra long prologue if I can get a character I could connect with, because now I feel like, I just felt like I've read a bunch of books that just the characters just didn't, I'm like, why would they do that though? And like, they didn't, they didn't have enough substance. I feel like to justify what happened in the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I felt okay with this. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I complained about it to myself that it's so long, but I told myself, you know, at the end of the story, because I like everything or I'm going to find something I like about the books anyway, I'm going to be like, okay, I need to learn more. Like what happened with their backstory? What's going on around them? You know? Yeah. Is there another book? Is there a book previous? So <laughs> like at the end, I'm like, I can't complain. Yeah. <laughs> So let's just really quickly before we get past this prologue, <laughs> how did you feel about how they described him as being like an ugly ass baby? <laughs> uh, how he was born an ugly duckling? Yeah. I'm like harsh. But you know what? Um, because this story is a little bit funny at the same time, it has a lot of humor. It reminded me of what my friend said. She just gave birth and I went to go visit her. And I'm like, who does she look like? And this happened with all three daughters. Yes. And she's like, I don't know. They still look like aliens. And then, <laughs> so that's what I thought about when I read that whole part about um, Sebastian being like, her daughters doesn't have big noses, but being like just big eyes and just like unproportioned. Yeah. I just think about what my friends said. Like they, they're supposed to look like aliens in the beginning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but... But like um, the whole nose thing, like I try to imagine it and I'm like, like Elmo, that's what I'm thinking. But um, it's, it's, I guess I can just say it adds to the story. He is, I I did read somewhere that this story is kind of like Beauty and the Beast, the retelling. So I'm Mm -hmm. like, okay, if you're going to make him look beastly, then okay, give him a big nose and just unproportioned limbs. And and yeah, I guess that will help. (laughs) But as a kid with unproportioned limbs, I had the longest limbs of all time growing up. Of mm-hmm. course, I grew into them, thank God. But like, I used to feel like a walking rubber band. That's just what I used to tell people. I'm like, I'm a walking rubber band and my arms just fly where they want to fly. 
Um, but yeah, I did like that this was a kind of Beauty and the Beast, Jane Eyre type feel. Those are two of my favorite all time books. So same, same. Yeah. So I and, love and Jane I Eyre. yes, and I imagined him. First of all, when they described him immediately, I thought of Quasimodo. I don't know, like <laughs> they described him as being so terrible that it actually took me a minute to take Quasimodo out of my mind, and then I replaced him with Gerard Depardieu because. Oh, that's I, better than what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, you know, but like it makes because Gerard Depardieu has a very large nose, and he's not mm-hmm. he's, so he's not like classically attractive. However, he has a swagger that just makes him hot to me. Like I love Gerard Depardieu. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, he could get it. So and like, he has that that frame too, uh-huh, right? He's got a big so. frame, you know, and that like shaggy hair and and whatever. But he just has that confidence and that like swag. So. That's kind of how I made Dane in my mind. In your mind. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought of, um, like, I just thought about the Hulk. Because I said, I refer to muscular guys that I read in our historical romances or in books general. I just go straight to the rock. And I'm like, okay, give, give, give um, this character somebody else. And I'm like, okay, he sounds like the Hulk, like really big. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's either the Hulk Lou Ferrigno. I mean, he's Italian. Or the Hulk, as in like when he's like talking, a little bit ta- more normal size, but he's still Wait, are big. you talking about uh, 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 Mark Ruffalo? Yeah. Oh, Mark yeah. Ruffalo as in is like, a nice. As in like not huge Hulk when he's actually kind of tame, but he's still green. Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm like, okay. Mark Ruffalo is a great choice. I yeah. I uh, support this. <laughs> I co-sign <laughs> Mark Ruffalo. Uh, <laughs> Um, and yeah. I thought it was so. I thought it really added to the book that they were like, you know, this is ugly baby. And then you felt really bad for him because, like, his father sends him away. He's bullied heavily in school until he actually learns how to fight. Mm-hmm. And then even the prostitute is like, "You are too ugly for me to have sex with." And then you have to pay me extra. He had to pay her extra, you know. And the book talks about how in that moment he learned that he needed to make money to basically be able to live a, a good life for himself, you yeah. know? And um, go to Oxford too, right? And go and pay his own way to Oxford because his dad was going to not send him to a legacy school. So then, you know, um, and so he ended up paying his own way. And I'm like, man, that is cold. That's cold blooded right there. Um, yeah. But that the book kind of- But good for of, you. <laughs> but good for, I know, good yeah. for him, you know? And so the book kind of starts there. So you have a really good sense of what Dane has to kind of put up with um, growing up. And you have compassion for him. And I think that without that kind of compassion, it kind of would make him just an asshole in the book in general. Like if you read this book without the prologue, you'd be like, why is she with this dude? And why, why should we care? Um, Or whatnot. So there's something missing. This romance novel is everything that you don't want in a romance novel. Right. (laughs) So, (laughs) but it's true. Like if we were, if this book was any other book, I felt like we would talk about it differently. But because it set it up that, yo, this guy is an asshole, mm-hmm. then you you had that expectation. Um, but if any other book the guy had, like a bastard, you'd be like, mm. uh, if he was sleep- <laughs> sleeping around with a whole lot of, a lot of other people in the book or whatever, you'd be like, mm. do you yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. this book Give is like something the, new. Yeah, this is like the quintessential anti-romance novel, I feel like, but a, in a romance novel. Um, so like, cause he brawls, he's, he's fights, he's fighting people. Um, he's like, he talks about women terribly. Um, I think I even have like this. He was quote. a good ass basically. <laughs> well, there's, there's this one, uh, quote where Bertie, uh, Jess's brother says marriage is for cowards, fools, and women. Jessica says that sounds like something, some drunken jackass would announce just before yeah. falling into the punch bowl to a crowd of his fellow drunken jackasses. And I love that line. And Bertie's like, well, no, Dane's not a jackass. And I'm like, yeah, that came from Dane, you yeah. know? And so like, I just thought that that was kind of indicative of like, oh, you don't want your hero to be talking like that in your books. You want him to, you know, be a little bit for the women. This, this guy is just a jerk. <laughs> yeah. So it was really interesting to see how things went, right, at the end. Yeah. Like, can things, like, turn around for him? Because <laughs> even at the end, it was like, okay, there's progress. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's definitely there, but um, I guess you don't want to change him too much. I am curious to know, at the very beginning of the book, when, they, when Jess 
finally meets Dane when she's with Birdie at the shop. How did you feel about their first initial meeting, their their encounter? I thought it was interesting that the author didn't let on that she was interested in him until yeah. later on. We find out that um, when she was talking to Genevieve about letting that proud brave guy and trying to reel him in. I'm like, oh, okay. I, I thought that's interesting. I didn't know she actually felt a certain way about him. That I liked. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, okay, it makes sense that it's it's not just one-sided. So uh, I think it sets it up nice where, okay, he this is different for him. So we'll see what, what else she does that makes him, you know, kind of evolve. Exactly. Yeah. And I like, so that first meeting, I felt... Loretta Chase like nailed the mm. the feeling of of the book. Like she nailed the feeling of the book in that first meeting. Um, they're in the shop. Birdie's there, and I love how Birdie thinks he's smart and just thinks yeah. he's an ultimate fucking idiot. <laughs> She's like, and and like. Legally, Birdie is in charge of Jess because he's a man. He's because he's a man, yeah. and Jess is just like no. And he tries to like assert his dominance at times, and she's just like no. I'm like that's so cute. Um, and I yeah, like you're not buying that watch for her. Don't encourage her, right? Yes, I thought that and, was cute. And she's was, like, I want that watch, and I'm like that. This is so funny. Their dialogue. Anybody with Birdie, <laughs> their dialogue. <laughs> it's going to be funny. You kind of feel bad for him sometimes. You do. You're just like, oh, you, you cute little stupid idiot. Like, yeah. You don't even And he's know oblivious it. to it. He's oblivious. That's what it is. An oblivious idiot. Yeah, but it adds to the charm of the story. So it, I, it does. <laughs> it really does. Especially because, like, her navigating um, Dane. Well, like, so in that first meeting, she insults Dane <laughs> <laughs> with, like, the most pretty language um that you could use which i thought was really great because birdie was there and so she basically insults dane and then birdie says uh any idea what she said dane and he's like yes men are ignorant brutes and then birdie's like you sure and dane's like quite (laughs) quite sure (laughs) you know and so like i felt like that set the tone for the book but it also showed that they were um that they were intrigued you know, like yes. it gave you the first intrigue of each other. And like, I identify as somebody who's sapiosexual. So physical attraction to a person is pr- almost non-existent. It's all mental for me. So I really don't care what somebody looks like. Like, yes, I would like someone who can lift me, <laughs> him, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> but in general, if somebody is smart enough and can grab my brain, I'm like, they could get it. So, you know, so I think like this is kind of that thing where there's like a connection where there's a connection of brains. Yeah. And, I don't know. An intellectual you, connection. Yeah. Yeah. I got you, that. you get that? Like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was really cool, you know? And then they have that little flirtation around the timepiece, um, where Dane goes, takes it from behind the counter, even though he's not the shop owner. Yeah. Um, and that shows like all his status right there because the shop owner doesn't say shit to him. Yes. Um, and then he's showing it to her. Like he's, revealing it to her like he's smarter than her yeah and um and then he's like oh w- look what happens when the skirt opens up and there's a man under her skirt and she's like yeah I get it yeah. <laughs> and she was playing around first too so I love that it's like, yeah don't judge her because she's pretty much if not more then she's just as smart as you yes and she was I mean that that's how they work their banter was amazing didn't you feel like just out the gate, even when she was talking to uh, her grandmother, Genevieve, uh, like out the gate, just a badass, like. <gasps> yes. Yeah. Just because then like, I-, I liked her from the beginning because I'm like, oh, okay, she likes antiques. I like antiques too. Like I-, 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 I can relate to her. And then I'm, and then we find out what she's looking at. I'm like, I love her even more. <laughs> There's no way you cannot like this lady. She's smart and she, she's odd in a way where um, people are going to be attracted to that. Yeah. So. I, I think smart never goes out of style, man. Learning, curiosity, people who are like interesting, that never goes out of style. And the older I get, and I don't know if you find this to be true as well, it's like the less and less and less and less things are determined physically, like for your partner. Um, and it becomes more mental 
and it becomes like just the things that you want out of a partner just completely shift because oh yeah I remember having a conversations in middle school and in middle school it was all about um oh man this is so funny but like everybody wanted a light-skinned black boy in my middle mm-hmm. school they wanted a light-skinned black boy <laughs> with, with green eyes Okay. Right? Basically, like there's a lot of them around, walking around. <laughs> yeah. Basically, like Corbin Blue, like a Corbin Blue type, uh, like you know, whatever. But that was like how everybody talked, and I didn't quite understand it at the time. I didn't know what was going on because my mom actually didn't really talk about race in our house mm-hmm. um, very much, and so and she didn't make it a thing. So there was actually a lot of times where I had to go home and ask questions and be like, "Mom, uh, like." I don't quite understand this or like, I remember my mom actually had to have this big talk with me one day because um, these girls at my school were like bullied me incessantly. Um, And they actually wanted me to be part of their friend group, but they were rough. And I was like, I don't want to be part of your friend group. Y'all be fighting people all the time. Yeah, like, for nothing, <laughs> for nothing. Probably. You know, so that's why I spent so much time in the library because I would like be hiding from these girls. Um, and I remember one day they like cornered me and they were like, why don't you want to be our friend? You know? <laughs> and this girl said to me, she's like, do you think, uh, do you think you're better than me? Cause you're light skin. And she blew my fucking mind. I remember going like, what? <laughs> like what? <laughs> uh, and so like, I am yeah, here, right? <laughs> like, like, what are you thinking? It, it was, it was so strange for me because like in my mind, I'm black and they're black. We both black. Right. But I never had, I never understood the difference of necessarily being a lighter skin versus darker skin. And so when she said, she said that to me and I literally go, but my sister has dark skin. Like, like, I you told her? like, I, yeah, that's what I, that's what I, because honestly, I, I couldn't, I could not fathom what they were talking about. Like if, if I think I'm better because I'm light skin, then I must be better than my sister who I adore, like the moon and stars. So mm-hmm. that's like saying I'm better than my sister. And I was just like, like, to me, my brain just was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, yeah. you know? And I didn't know it was like a whole systemic thing of, you know, and that sort of thing. And it wasn't until later on that I found out that I got better treatment from aunties and other people because I was a lighter skinned child. Like my mom, I remember now, but I definitely had this aunt of my mom's who would come over and she'd be so sweet to me. She'd buy me gifts, all sorts of stuff. And she wouldn't buy anything for my sister um, or whatever. And my mom had to stop her from doing that, but I never put it together. And then I had to like years ago, talk to my sister and be like, Hey, can you tell me what your experiences are being, um, having darker skin? And she started telling me all this stuff. And I was like, I haven't, I didn't experience any. And so it was like, blew my freaking mind. Um, so that was an interesting thing, like lesson on colorism um, that I had, that I got, you know, at that mm-hmm. time. And we're going home and being like, mom, why does somebody think I'm better? And she had to sit down and have this whole like lesson for you, lesson in colorism for me that still I thought was the dumbest thing ever. I was like, this is dumb. People are dumb. I was just, yeah, <laughs> it's something we shouldn't be like thinking about. Like, is that person good? Are they bad? That's the kind of thing you're supposed to be thinking about, right? Exactly. And I know it exists in so many different uh, cultures. I know like I watch a lot of Bollywood, so it exists a lot in Bollywood. It exists a lot. I have a friend uh, who's Filipino um, and it exists a lot because Filipinos tend to be a little bit darker than others. Like me. Are you Filipino? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Hey. (laughs) (laughs) You know? And so like, and so when I remember when Crazy Rich Asians came out, we were having a whole conversation on colorism and that sort of thing. You know, even we loved crazy rich Asians. Um, and I think it was a good movie. It was was beautiful, fucking beautiful movie. Yeah. You know, and I know some people had had, the money, right? (laughs) I would have a wedding like that. Listen, I don't want to get married, but I would get married if I could have a wedding like they had (laughs) in crazy rich Asians. the water rising up, like fuck out of here. (laughs) Up like 10 notches. Yes. That was was amazing. Oof. That's, you know, I will marry any, anyone who's going to give me this wedding. I'll marry you. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but it was interesting because we definitely had to talk about it then because like the leading man in that, I think he's biracial. He's like white and, and uh, I think he's British. Yes, he's British, but he's like half white and half. 
Chinese? Um, I don't know what it the should other be Chinese. Yeah, I think Chinese, but I'm I actually yeah. not 100 percent sure. Um, we went on a colorism tangent, <laughs> and we're bringing it back. So this was probably the most fun part of the book, uh, and I would like to hear your thoughts on it as well. So I I thought they had chemistry right off the bat, um, and it was good chemistry with smart chemistry, and then they kept fooling around. And I thought, ooh, that fooling around is kind of hot as well. Um, but then they get caught fooling around. And he basically thinks she set him up. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I wouldn't marry you like if you were the last woman on earth type of thing. So Jess is pissed at this point. She didn't want to marry him anyway, like, or at least not at that point. And she's pissed. So she decides she just yeah. she's going to shoot him. Yeah. And she does. She just point blank walks up to him and is like, say your prayers. Boom. And she shoots it. <laughs> that was amazing. I mean, he said, then shoot me. And then she did. Like, yeah. oh, you do. <laughs> I think like hands down, best scene in a romance novel ever. <laughs> oh, yes. I don't even recall um, any stories doing that. And at the same time, we find out that she did it on purpose, knowing that, because then right after she goes to the police, I'm like, lock me up, because then yep. this is the only safe place I can be, because he's, pl- he's going to kill me. So <laughs> I think that was great planning, too. They both just are so good at assessing situations and planning things out just to, and then it's basically like just winning that little war. I think you nailed it, because I didn't quite put like words to that, but they have these little battles that are going on the yeah. entire time. Yeah, battles. And yeah, each, that's each that's one that. is winning at different times. Each one is winning because after she shoots him, she basically knows there's nothing he can really do about it because she, uh, they both are of the aristocracy um, mm-hmm. and the way they handle uh, disputes is different. So he, she's not really going to get arrested. There's nothing really going to get done. And then he, they don't really want people to know that, that a woman shot him. You know, so <laughs> so they're kind of at this like impasse, you know, after she shoots him. Until like he gets served. So he gets served, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so like uh after this happens, um, she basically serves him with a lawsuit claiming defamation of character. Um, and that he owes her basically money for her to live for the rest of her life because she can no longer open the shop that she wanted to open because she's been ruined um, and she won't make a good match and such and such. And so she is just hoping for compensation. And he's like, well, if I marry you, then I'll have um, satisfied this defamation because then you'll be married and you'll be taken care of and that sort of thing. So fuck you. I'm just going to marry you. <laughs> yeah. So I can have the marriage rights and the breeding rights. <laughs> and the, that's, that's a great line. <laughs> I love that. That was so good. I'm like, oh, he's so smart. And I'm trying to figure out like, so how is she going to get back at him? You know, because that's just how they are. It's a game of chicken and nobody is a chicken. Every time they're like, I see your $2. I'm putting down $5. Oh, I see your $5. <laughs> And I put down $10. <laughs> um, and he knows and, wagers, rights and investments mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So that was, there. it was really good. Yeah. Their scenes are amazing. Like, it's it's too funny because you don't expect certain things to happen. No. <laughs> um, I think that uh, once they get married, though, um, this is kind of like where the story takes a really cool turn for me. So before this, they, I mean, they, throughout the whole book, they have amazingly intelligent banter. And um, I think Jess is really good at being kind of the more of the voice of reason and like a calmer voice to, to his kind of manic. Like your own immaturity. <laughs> yes. As I learn more and as I learn more like about psychology and about trauma and that sort of thing, it's hard not to read a book and then sort of diagnose the, the uh, characters, you know? And for me, like, Dane is like a quintessential, like, kid who got traumatized at eight years old. And so he's emotionally stunted at eight years old. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Jess is well-rounded. She's been living her best life, you know, single <laughs> and that sort of thing. And then so she gets a partner who has all this anxiety from childhood, who, which is unaddressed and shows up in manic ways that 
don't quite make sense, but they make sense to, if you know that this is an eight, like a traumatized kid who's stuck at eight, then everything that Dane does makes sense. Cause even when they get, they get married and he's starting, um, Jess is starting to kind of work on him emotionally and he's starting to do well. He's starting to open up. And then the prostitute who had his son, his bastard yeah. son, um, <laughs> shows up at this uh, wrestling match. And she's like, there's your dad <laughs> or whatever. And it just throws Dane into a tizzy. And every bit of work that Jess has done to get him to be a mature adult just flies out the window, yeah. you know, and he kind of turns back into an asshole. And she's like, she's like, how can I, you know, do this with him if he just is going to regress every time that some, you know, something goes out of plan, you know? So that they do mention in the story that she grew up kind of rearing like her young male relatives. So all she has to do is kind of revert back to that kind of tone and voice and kind of thinking so that she's able to handle him. Yeah. So that helped out for him. So, and so like with Dane, that's exactly kind of how I felt about Dane. Like when every time he would go into these anxious moments, like, you would see you see him as a little kid who's insecure about someone actually loving him or caring for him or that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what I mean? And that was an interesting, uh, it was a very interesting dynamic to see. Um, and I thought it was very smart writing. Like Loretta Chase, this is smart ass writing. <laughs> Yeah, and there is a part where she actually, or he actually thinks like, okay, I know I'm being immature, but I'm still going to act like this because this is how I was at eight. This is how I know how to process things, whatever. Um, I forgot which scene it was. I think it was in the cafe. I'm sorry. Yeah, but even he knows like I'm being immature. But I'm still yeah. going to go with it because her, she's attacking my pride. <laughs> she's attacking me. I have to attack her back. Yeah. Somebody's got to win. Like, yeah. And uh, it's going to be me. <laughs> it's going to be him. It has to be him. But it never works out. Yeah. It never works out because she always finds out, like, what best to do to <laughs> twerk him. <laughs> it, it, it really doesn't work out. I, I think she's always, even in her own mind when she's kind of freaking out, she always is like trying to think about what's the best thing to do for the situation. Even when he, yeah. he has this whole freak out and whatever um, he's like, don't meddle. She's like, fine, I won't meddle, you know? And she stops saying like, I love you. She stops being like mm-hmm. super into sex or whatever. She won't instigate anything. She just becomes like a living doll essentially for yeah. him. And he's like, well, I don't want that either. <laughs> what do like, you want then? Yeah. She's like, what do you want? You either get a living version of me with all my thoughts, opinions, and ideas, or you just get like an automaton, you know? Um, I think he's like, at one point, he's like, don't manage me. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm not managing you. You're, you're smart enough to know you're going to, and you're going to do that anyway. So I'm just kind of leading you there. So, yep. And like, so it's good. It's yeah. yeah and, and, it's funny because like uh, sometimes we joke like in general, any partner you have, you're going to have to manage. And I've always thought that you were good. You'd have to manage your partner. Like very recently just watched all of my girl family members managing their husbands and managing their partners in a way that I was like, they were, you know what it was? They were managing ego. And there's one thing about helping your partner and, you know, learning how to work in and out of their um, idiosyncrasies. And there's another thing having to stroke someone's ego so you can get something done. And mm-hmm. that's the thing I, I don't want to ever do again is manage someone's ego. I don't want to have to do this whole dance around a subject in order to get what I need done. Instead of just being able to say like, Hey, I need X, Y, Z to happen. You know, cause then there's no growth. It's just going to be you growing and somebody you're trying to pull somebody along. <laughs> exactly <laughs> nailed it tony <laughs> yeah because and that's what she did that's what i liked about her like yeah. um she knew exactly how to like handle him mm-hmm. to put it plainly yeah uh, in a way where if he goes back and and he's like mad at her for helping or meddling or managing she's like um no you know again like you know what to do i'm just letting you know that you know, you have to do it now 
Because you're going to do the you're going to do the right thing later anyway. So, yes. Charity um, brings the son to the wrestling match. And afterwards, you know, uh, Dane like hurries Jess out of the way. Um, mm. And Dane's uh, so-called friend, you know, takes Charity away. Um, and he thinks he's gotten one over on Jess that she didn't see this yeah. little boy who looks exactly like Dane. Um, and she's like, so dumb. You- he's so dumb. <laughs> so dumb. She's like, are you, do you think I'm an idiot? I- <laughs> I resonated so hard with that when, I, when she's like, do you think I'm an idiot? Yeah. You know, and I love how this book never, it hadn't, there was not one point in this book where I was like, wait, that doesn't make sense because nobody would do it that like that. You know, every time it was like, oh no, I know exactly what's happening here, you know? And so she was like, you have, you ruined it. Like we had access to that boy right then. You could have gotten your son and we could have helped him. And now that you've chased, us away and them away now we got to find him again and dane's like i don't want to find him i don't want to find that little bastard <laughs> and yeah, she's like call him that idiot he he's so <laughs> he's such a dick yeah. <laughs> like he calls him like a miscreant and all sorts of other names you know and she's like no that's your son she's like i don't care about the woman but the son is the son he's a kid he's innocent in this whole thing and we're gonna figure out something for him you know so after that she starts uh, searching for him and talking to the coachman and getting putting out her feelers to fi- figure out uh, to figure out where he is, and I feel like that's real. Um, that's real indicative of who Jess is. You know, she's very matter of fact. Like this child exists. Um, there's you had him way before you like I was ever in the picture, um, and he needs a loving home, and that's what's going to happen. And it's so funny that she's the one pushing for it and not his actual father. Uh, <laughs> You know, and what happens next is like the thing that I, um, so I used to be, I used to be a postpartum doula and mm-hmm. basically that's like, interesting. Wow. <laughs> it's not that interesting. Basically I'm your like, I'm your like abuelita. Like I come to your house when you have a baby, I teach you how to take care of the baby. I teach you what's, how to readjust your household in order to mm-hmm. meet the needs of everybody. Now everybody's new normal, you know, um, and depending on what the the gender of the baby is actually um, changes some the dynamic in the home, right? So, you know, when they always say like a mama's boy or a daddy's girl, that's like mm-hmm. very true. And I'm leaving out the gender binaries here for simplicity's sake, um, but I do recognize that exists. But in general, in when a baby comes out, nobody's ever thinking like, this is a gender neutral baby. Um, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Very, few, very few. It's very progressive thought. Um, but we- I want to do that now. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm pretty sure I try to, but then when you have other people and their thoughts, then you, you revert back to how you know yeah. things are, and you give them like, oh, okay, yeah, no. But you want to, but at the same time, you're like, I want to build strong kids, not strong boys, strong like pretty girl. Yeah, you want to. So. You just want to give them. For me, I just try, like with my nieces and nephews, I don't genderize anything. Like That's painting good. your, anybody can paint their nails. Like my nephew was just um, visiting and um, he was talking, I said something about putting on makeup and he was like, oh, I want to see. And I was like, oh, do you want to put some makeup on me or whatever? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, That's fine. You know, for me, I firmly believe that everything is data to kids. There's nothing genderized. So him wanting to put on makeup is the equivalent of him wanting to paint. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Um, I think some people don't realize or they forget that um, at a certain age, I think it's like age three, kids don't know the difference between boy and girl. They'll, they'll, if they're a boy and they like pink, they like pink. It's not because he's like a certain way. Yeah. But I think a lot of people forget that. It's, it's, you learn it at, in like child psychology. <laughs> so. Well, it's funny you say that because my niece is three. And so I had her and my nephew who was five right and my sister was like can you give them a bath like together and I was like yeah sure no problem and so I'm giving them a bath and as she as she walks out the door she goes uh good luck giving her the talk and I was like what what (laughs) and I didn't know what she meant and as soon as I put them in the bathtub her daughter goes um why him have that and points right at his (laughs) penis it's right at his penis and I was like son of a bitch (laughs) 
to try Welcome to, to give, the top. <laughs> yes, like, and the thing was, I was trying to give like an explanation that didn't attach sex with gender, mm-hmm. and I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. I'm sure I failed. You know what I mean? Because like, it was hard not to just be like, boys have a penis and girls have a vagina. You know, <laughs> which is like what you're, what you learn like growing up. Yeah. But like in movies was, and shows. Yeah, <laughs> like you're like you have, you know, and so she's just sort of like, why him have that? <laughs> and I was like. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> you know, and I was like, some people are born with penises and some people are born with vaginas. And, and, but I actually gave them a full explanation because I was like, some people are born with penises. Some people are born with vaginas. Some people are born with both or whatever. Oh, you went uh, that far. And then, and then I was like, <laughs> and you have an anus. So I told <laughs> like, and you have an anus back here. And then my <laughs> nephew, and then my nephew goes, and I have a neck. I was like, yes, you do. Okay, cool. <laughs> Let's keep going with bath time. <laughs> yeah. He gave you a way out. Was nice. <laughs> like, I was like, yes. But like I tell everybody, it's just data right now with kids. If you make it weird, it will be weird. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, it's only weird if you make it weird. So like for him, he's like, okay, these are my body parts. Those are her body parts. And I have a neck. Cool. Done. Got it. You know what I mean? And so like. So I don't know. That was just a really funny. <laughs> like, That's a good story. That's a great story. Actually. Why him? Why him have that? <laughs> it's like, uh. oh, Love that. Uh, kids, so, kids are amazing. Kids are really funny. Um, yeah. And so, okay. So, you know, Jess hunts down. Let's talk about her hunting down. Speaking of, speaking of sons. So Jess hunts down Dominic and uh, they catch him. They catch him kind of at the summer home or something of, of she tackles him. Yeah, she tackles him. <laughs> which which is so great because I I was really wondering how that was gonna go. Cause you had the footman try to tackle him and get punched in the nut, <laughs> you know, and then she not only tackles him, but then she like grabs his hair. She like completely yanks his hair and he just goes limp. And she was like, I will scalp you. She said something, I forget what she said, but basically she's like, I will scalp you. I'll pull your hair until you like ancestors feel it, you know. Um <laughs> And which is really funny that she was just like, just as like willing to get down and dirty for what she wants. She's like, I have raised boys crazier than you. So yeah. good luck, you know? Um, yeah. She knows how to get rough. So exactly. like, what she needs to, especially. Exactly. With, and like, then, so how did you feel about, okay. So when charity appears after they catch uh, Dominic, then charity appears going like, Oh, I was looking for my dear son, you know, or whatever. Like, liar. <laughs> Cause she had a good point. Like uh, when, when she first saw Dominic, she's like, look at how she's dressed. She's dressed good enough. And then he's in rags. Like, obviously we need to go get him because she's not taking care of him. But then what was interesting is Dominic, he, he cowered towards Jessica, huh? So I'm yep. like, okay, that's interesting. I'm like, she seems so nice. Her voice is so nice for her son, but he doesn't want to, like, he runs away from her. So, like, what is going on? So, so it's, it's, it adds to the story and why she needs to go and rescue him. And, yeah. she, well, she makes Dane go get him. So, yeah, <laughs> I like that. I mean, which, which, it, which she manages him and tells him, basically, I'm managing you. <laughs> Like you, you have this choice and it's me managing you, which I thought was pretty funny, but you're right. Like Dominic was like clinging to her. He didn't want to go with his mom, you mm-hmm. know, and that really solidified to her. Like, Oh, he's being besides that fact that she hasn't seen his mom in two weeks, he's being abused, yeah. like, you know, or neglected. Then when he shows, when she shows up, he doesn't want to leave Jess. So now, you know, he's being abused. Um, and then Charity's trying to, I like their interaction actually, because at first she tries to play like coquette, like, like an innocent, you know, whatever. And she's like, Oh, my son, you know, whatever. And then yeah. Jess is like, please, like, l- let me just tell you how this is going to go. Like, yeah. if you really cared about him, you would have been here already. You had already been here. Okay. We would have already done the thing. You know? She's yeah. like, what, what do you really want? And Charity's like, well, shit, if I ain't got to do this masquerade, <laughs> like, what that I really want cool. is that portrait that's worth 20,000, like, you know, dollars, pounds, whatever, um, or whatever. And of course, Jess has already given that portrait to Dane as a gift, um, mm-hmm. at which Dane treasures this gift that she's given him because he talks about how 
the last gift he got was from his mom when he was eight before she left. So um, he, she just already knows he's not going to part with this. Um, and there's a cute little scene where when she gives it to him, he does, he knows how important the gift is and he doesn't really know how to act. So he's like scripting it out in his head where he's like, where he's like, you know, well, thank you. Like, mm-hmm, you know, very much for this yeah. you know, gift or whatever. Crying on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, inside, he's like, I got a gift or whatever. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, that seemed like a sensible thing to say. Like, I think I nailed that, you know, <laughs> and just kind of knowing how he is, you know, works very hard not to make it a big deal that she gave it to him and let it gloss over because she knows he's not ready to handle those kinds of emotions, mm-hmm. you know, yet or whatever. So I thought that was actually a cute, like, um, very emotionally intelligent moment from, from Jess. But I think in general, the whole book, she's very emotionally intelligent, even when she gets pissed, <laughs> she gets like pissed off. Um, so the next thing that happens is she goes to Dane and she tells him what's up. She's like, look, she wants your portrait and I'm gonna give it to her unless you go to the train station tomorrow and pick up Dominic and take her from, you know, charity or whatever and bring him back. And there's actually a scene in between um, where Charity is taking the son um, and Dom- Dominic's friend is there. Um, sorry, where Charity's taking the son and Dane's friend is there or so-called friend um, is there with Charity because they're conspiring because he's broke and they're conspiring to get this portrait from Dane. Um, but you see that she drugs Dominic to get yeah. him in the carriage. And then Dominic spends like, the whole time vomiting and throwing up and being extremely sick. I think in general, drugging your children is frowned upon. I know that I was drugged as a kid. Before we got on the plane, my mom was like, Benadryl for you and Benadryl for you. And Benadryl. It still happens. <laughs> it still happens. Sometimes it's a joke. Sometimes it's necessary. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I don't have any, I'm not going to say I have any judgment about it because I, the more people I meet, the more kids I meet, the more whatever, I'm kind of like, you know, you never really know what people are going through and what's happening or what, like, what conditions people's kids have or that sort of thing. So if you see somebody giving their kids some sort of medication, you just mind your business because you don't know what's happening on their side of the line. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, but they kind of imply that Charity gave him more um, <laughs> laudanum than he could handle or, you know, was good for a child. Um And so, yeah, so he ends up vomiting up a bunch. And when they hear that Dane is coming, um, Dane comes to the inn where they're staying. His friend jumps out the window into a haystack. And then Charity runs out of the room and she tells tells him, like, take care of the kid. He's worth money. Of course, the guy doesn't. He leaves when he jumps out the window. Um, And the kid is just a crumple on the floor vomiting when Dane gets there. Um, And they describe him pretty pitifully. Um, Did this... Did this scene uh, hit you any sort of way? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, why not? Like, And then you leave your kid who's already neglected and you're already abusive. <laughs> I cannot fathom anyone doing that to their own kid. I, I don't have my own kids, but like hell, I'm going to leave my friend's kids, like, alone. Like, I have one of my friend's daughters. She's taller than me. I still make sure they're on the inside of the sidewalk I still make sure I'm like okay hold on to me like I know you're like 10 to her sister and I'm like but just hold on to me everyone has to stick together like like and and also I don't know but even like with dogs like I can't leave them alone one I, there was a good like six months I was home by myself so I was um house sitting and watching um my family's dogs and I kept telling my sister like Hey, you gotta come to the house. You gotta come, make sure I'm at work. Make sure that they're okay, and make sure that they're not like stuck anywhere or whatnot. Because I saw the the big dog like on the barbecue. That's not right. What if he got hurt? So, because he had to jump up, and and I was very worried. So, for her, for the mother to just leave her kid like that with a stranger, like whatever yeah. that's your lover, but same thing. Yeah, no, that is not right. So I'm glad Jess is there. Yeah, I and, I and she came up with like different like scenarios too. So there was like Plan B. Yeah, so that helped out, which is really great because like Jess had planned it out. Like, okay, if something goes wrong, then the uh, the driver um, will like bribe Charity, and he so the so when the driver found Charity sneaking out the back, 
Then he gave her money to go to Paris and was like, look, you're about to be 30, which apparently is very old. <laughs> In those days, it's very old. Um, you're about to be 30. You you can't be a prostitute forever, basically, because you're not going to get the same money here. But in Paris, you will. So take this money, go to Paris, and you know start your life over there. Yeah. Um, which Just don't come like, back. Yeah. She's like, you know, Charity's like deuces. See, <laughs> she had this whole plan <laughs> with Dane's friend, and and then she was like, nope, nope, I'm good. Like I'm going to Paris. A um, savage. <laughs> that was great. Like, actually, I was like, yes. Uh, so then. Uh, you know, and Jess thought about that eventuality and, and she didn't go, they talk about this, that she didn't go behind Dane and try to like also go to the meeting or whatever. She trusted that he would do it. She had a talk with him ahead of time. Like, Hey, I don't want the boy to be traumatized. Make sure that, you know, the first energy he's getting from you is a good energy. It's a loving energy. It's, you know, a safety trusting. energy, a trusting energy, you know? Um, and you could see that Dane listened to that. Like, you could see that he was willing to take her word. Um, and I think one of the things you see with Dane over the course of the book is he goes from being an egomaniac, <laughs> you know, to having a lot less ego by the end of the book. He's willing to let this woman tell him what he needs to do. Cause he realizes like, I don't know shit. She's already way ahead of me. She's way smarter than me. What am I, why am I fighting it? You yeah. know, <laughs> just don't let her know. Right. Cause yeah, she's that know? smart. Don't let her know. Uh, you know, and then by the end, you really see the appreciation and and the symbio symbiosity, <laughs> symbiosis, symbiosis, <laughs> whatever that word is. You you <laughs> you see them work in tandem very well. Um, and symbiotic, symbiotic. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that was my brain glitching. Um, but you, but you see it working really well between them because now they have. Um, they're working as a partnership and as a team and their um, thoughts and feelings are valid to each other. Um, and it also like one of the things that happens in this book is something I say a lot, which is uh, if a man wants you in his life, he will make room for you. Like that has been my um, experience for like my life outside of like my first couple relationships where we were in college and we didn't know no better and we were just <laughs> going along, which those are just what they are, cute little fun things. Um, but outside of that, when I had like more serious relationships, um, I watched my partners like make room for me because I have certain expectations of what, you know, is going to happen. Um, but my uh, latest partner, when we met, he was in like bachelor mode all the way. He was like living my best life and whatever. And I was also in that same mind frame where I was like, I don't want anything serious. I just, I had just started getting into kink. So I just wanted a play partner, like not even a sexual partner, just a play partner. And so we both, when we met and whatever, we'd actually been friends before this, but um, we were like, oh, well we could just play together. And it was like, cool, let's just play together. Sounds great to me. And one day we were joking. He was like, don't fall in love with me. And I was like, don't fall in love with me because I just want to play. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we fell in love with each other. <laughs> and that's great though. <laughs> and then he, I watched him grow up. Like from the, I, I watched in his eyes him make the choice and then start systematically changing everything in his life to grow up for me. Um, and that, and like, so nobody can tell me if a man wants you in his life, he will make all the room for you that needs to be there. And yeah. one of the things that I think is important just for anybody listening, um, ego is a real thing. We all have an ego and there's a lot of, um, dropping ego that has to be done. If you want to be in love, I don't care what anybody says, <laughs> If you want to be in love and you want to stay in love, you cannot have ego because people are going to fuck up and you're going to need to get things done. And it can't be like, don't tell me what to do or what did it or this is, you know, that sort of thing, that kind of energy is just not going to help you sustain any sort of love. So that's my soapbox. I'm getting off of it now. <laughs> well, they do kind of bring that up into the story, right? Marriage requires adjustments yeah. on both sides. Mm -hmm. So you said exactly what they said in the story. 
Because it's true. I mean, uh, it's it's a give and take. It's not just take, 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 or yeah. give, 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 right? It has to be both. But I also find like, and I don't know if you do as well, but like, you when you love someone, I feel like you want to make adjustments. Like, you want the world, like I always say for my partner, I want to make your world beautiful. Just let me. Like, I want to make your world magic. Just let me. I will make your world magic if you let me. Like, um, and that's kind of like saying that. It's like, there's a, a saying in kink that I learned, which is like, always, in, always assume positive intent, right? So if somebody does something for you and it doesn't go right, and you're like, why did you do that? But in your brain, you go like, oh, they did that to try to be caring. It just didn't work out. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, wow. That's a good way of looking at things. Well, <laughs> because like, that's your partner. Learn something they, from kink. <laughs> yes. Well, I learned a lot from kink, like life lessons from kink. <laughs> I think everybody should learn about kink just to learn the life lessons you get from, from the classes. I took, I took BDSM classes. It was great. There's classes. Uh, there's classes. Good to know. And now they're on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you want the information for some uh, BDSM Zoom classes, there's like a BDSM 101 um, class series that I love. Um, hit me up on Instagram and I will DM you the link so you can go um, to uh, Mistress Jen's class i don't think you're, i think you just call her jen <laughs> but but uh dear listeners if you want that i got that information for you so um but yeah like if you always if you always assume positive intent from people it changes how you look at things it's like almost like being more grateful than ungrateful and um it gives you compassion and grace for people and like even right now during covid i try to tell people like Everybody right now gets COVID grace from me, right? Like, you don't show up to a thing, COVID grace. Forget to call me back, COVID grace. Like, it doesn't matter what happens. (laughs) Everybody gets COVID grace because shit is up in the air right now. And people have given me COVID grace, thank God, in these last few weeks that I've been trying to get home desperately. And I'm in the middle of, of a moving situation on top of just trying to get my life back together on top of editing freaking music videos so like i'm like call, even you i was like uh can we do this podcast on monday because i am overwhelmed <laughs> no <laughs> everything like, everything worked out <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you know thank that, you for doing that <laughs> you know, but i'm like thank you for that grace that was that was you know awesome and um and so like i just find that to be something that is uh helpful and you see just give uh, Dane, a lot of grace in the book. And you, yeah. the one thing that Dane, um, the one thing that Jess does that I super duper love, um, and I also do this myself with my partner, is whenever he talks about his mom in a negative light, she brings it back to a positive light. Oh my gosh, what must she have been going through to have to have left her son? What was the dad that who treated you poorly? Imagine how he treated her. Like, she tries to take her portrait and put it in a place of prominence in his house so that he has a good energy about his mom. And you see him shift. Like the way he starts thinking about his mom shifts as he starts thinking of Jess in a different light um, overall and in women in a different light. Um, and she always gives him that encouragement because if you talk poorly about someone's parent, you kind of talk poorly about them. That's a piece of you, you know? And, she, and so she never does. No matter what he says about his mom, she always spins it back into like a positive, you know, yeah. situation, um, which I thought. She was did a- look at it a different way, too. Right. Because he's like, look, your dad was old. Your mom was like really young. Yeah. He was a prude. She was adventurous. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, she was going to run away. But at least you have a roof under your head. Yeah. What's the problem? <laughs> yep. And you also hear in the book, like when they first got married, that the dad thought the son was so ugly that he refused to have sex with her anymore to have more kids. <laughs> so here you have a young wife. I know how horny yeah. I am. Okay. Like <laughs> I, I wake up horny, I go sleep horny and it just gets worse and worse throughout the day. Like, I don't know what happens when you turn freaking 30 and then you turn like 34 35 36 but apparently according to my mom it only get you only get hornier as you get older 
now, so now in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna be like a horny ass 60 year old at some point. And like, kind of hope. Like Genevieve? <laughs> yes. Like Genevieve. I was like, I thought like you go through menopause, it'll, it'll go down. And my mom was like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> I was like, oh really? Um, so like, he has this young ass wife that he won't have sex with. She wants to have sex. So of course she runs away with a lover because she's got this husband that won't have sex with her. She's probably locked in. Can't, she's suffocating. You know, and she has to make a choice and she decides not to take her son on this random adventure with her because it might not be good for him, you know, and that that's something Jess brings up and is a very valid point. And I think that um, Sebastian can see that she has valid points when he says that he's like, he, she left you here in the safety with a home and servants and people to take care of you instead of taking you to the West Indies where with no money and no guarantee that you would have a good life, you know. And he was like, well, you bring up good points. <laughs> because nobody did. Nobody did talk to him in that way. The closest person who gave him comfort, comfort was the cook. Yeah. So he can stop, you know, crying and stuff like that. Yep. So, so, and, and that's so sad going, what, he, he was like 33, 33 years, eight, yeah. 25 years of not hearing something like that. So she, she was great. She was great for him in that, what, two months or whatever they were together. <laughs> yep. And when and when she says I love you and he's just like I've never heard that before yeah. you know and then when when she takes the I love you's back not she doesn't take him back but she stops saying it when he's yeah. act, acting like a dick he's like I fucked her and tried to do everything I could just to get her to say I love you again and she yeah. won't. he's a salty about it he's a little <laughs> salty snack you know and <laughs> so stupid uh, like so, come on yeah, I was like, I thought that was, I thought that was, and that was funny. That was really funny, though. Yeah, but she definitely managed him to the end. And at the end, I think he was like, I know you're managing me, and I don't care. Like as long as I have you and you don't leave me, yeah, like let's go. I'm, I'm for it, you know. And I thought their, I thought their love story was, um, it's not typical, and uh, it was complicated and complex, um, and everything to me made sense and was justified. Um, I even liked how there was no murder in this book, right? Every book, when there is like somebody trying to steal a thing, they're willing to murder for it. When, when, oh, we didn't even talk about this. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's talk about this and then we'll go to our, <laughs> our we'll go to our break. Okay. So like, let's talk about um, when uh, Dane's friends uh, lights his summer house on fire and then sneaks in to his house to find the miniature and then you tell you tell what happened after that so jess finds him and there's a miniature in his hand and vautry vautry starts running away so she runs after him and she pretty much again tackles somebody (laughs) she's beating him up beating him up like (laughs) at the end she's like yeah and she's like um like grabbing him and just like beating him to the ground. It was amazing. And Dane and Dominic comes in like m- mouths open and then Dane goes and like picks her up just so, so that she could stop hitting the yeah. guy. And I thought that, that was, was freaking amazing. That was uh, great. <laughs> There's a, a point where they describe her as grabbing his head and slamming it against the door jam or whatever, yeah. over and over and over again. And I was like, in my mind, I could totally envision her just in a rage, just like, and later on, she's like, you know, I could, I would have stopped if he had just let go of the miniature, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? But I like the fact that his friend wasn't at the point of murder. He was like trying to defend himself without hitting her because he, she's still a woman and that's still yeah. his friend's wife. And he's, he's not willing to go to that extent for the money, you know? And so... I just thought that was interesting because always in these books, somebody's trying to murder someone and the stakes weren't that high. Um, and I like that they weren't that high. I like it that it was, you know, two people who were, who were shady trying to get something done, but they weren't really committed to the full. <laughs> yeah. You know, Charity was well, gone. Yeah. She was like, she got a little money. She was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> Plan B came, I'm taking it. I'm taking it, you know? (laughs) Um, And then Jess was just freaking like a savage, just just myrtalizing him. I love Uh, it. I think she knew he wasn't going to fight back because he's also the guy who gave her, you know, his coat when she got, like, ruined in the garden. So, and 
and at the same time, like she, you can see how how much love that she does have for family, and of yeah. course for Dane, that she'll do whatever she needs to do in order for him to stay happy, be happy, whatever. And if that means like fighting for that little Russian acorn that Bernie calls it, <laughs> yes. then she'll do it. She'll beat you up. Yeah. Yes, and uh, um, and that's so that's kind of how the story starts wrapping up. And then you find out later that a kind of, I'm not sure if you call it like a mutual friend. I, I don't know if they're frenemies or what, like Beaumont, who's like a frenemy of Dane's, put um, put him up to, he told him that the miniature was worth more so he would try to steal it. Um, and so that in Charity heard it from him that, oh, it's worth 20,000. And so she not, that's what made her want to steal it. And Dana's like, you idiot. This is like worth 5,000 at most or whatever. Yeah. Like, what were you doing? And then he yeah. finds out that, oh, his friend was pretty much, this whole thing happened because his friend is having a jest. You know, he just thought it'd be funny to be a little bit of an anarchy in people's life and plant some false information to get people riled up about a thing um, and cause problems for Dane. So like, then Dane decides to kind of flip the script um, and like tells him to uh, send him a letter and basically making it out that he's uh, it ended up really good for him. Like yeah. all this false information, you know, ended up in a really happy outcome and that sort of thing. And so like his friend can't get any satisfaction from yes. like f- fucking with his existence, you know? <laughs> Uh, so, so I in know. a way, Dane wins again. <laughs> Dane got yeah. him when he was peeping behind, like the hole, and Dane got him again. Yep. But I like that he was mature enough so that he could. Or it is a story, but he could help his friend Vachi also. Yeah. Right. Like you stay the hell away from me. I'll pay for your debts, but go play a trick on Boma. <laughs> yeah. For me. Yeah. So. And I like that he made him marry Charity. He was like, you have to go to Paris, yeah. find Charity, and marry her, and make sure she stays the fuck away from my yeah. family. That's like, your job. Bitch crazy. Yeah. Bitch yeah. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It says that he, he adored her, so I'm like, okay, that's nice. He has his happily ever after, too, right? Yeah. Well, he talks yeah. about how when he got the 20000 he was going to take her abroad to Paris and show her a new life. So he did really adore Charity. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I have a little, I have compassion for Charity as well because, you know, she's made out to be the villain in the story. But again, she's a woman who was kind of forced into prostitution and is just trying to make a living and is just trying to make her way the best way she knows how. So mm-hmm. she's also coming from circumstances that were not ideal and she's got to you know, do it. And she had a baby that she's not prepared to take care of. And she actually did pay for that boy to be taken care of by a really yeah. awesome woman. And then that woman died. Then she didn't know what else to do with this kid. So even, uh, even she is just not that tragic. Uh, I mean, even she's not like that um, unredeemable of a character for me. She definitely has uh, a backstory that you can kind of feel even though they don't go heavily into it, you can feel that that's there. So there's no like outwardly list of, like terrible, terrible villain to me that I just like, I hate them so much. Um, everybody <laughs> kind of is like a flawed character in their own way of, you know, circumstance. So romance besties, if you have any thoughts on this book, especially I'm actually curious to know how people feel about charity. Like, is she the worstest? <laughs> <laughs> or is there a little bit of redemption for her? Um, because I, I've been having this debate like for two days with my sister. Um, so like, <laughs> who just thinks she's the worst? She's like, she's like, there's no redemption. You can't fuck with kids, like, or whatever. And I'm like, well, you know, so let me know how you feel about charity. Uh, should we toss her out? <laughs> or do we have a little bit of love for her? Um, and with that, said uh, i'll see you on instagram and we're gonna take a short break come back with our ratings um for our peeps hello best friends thank you for being loyal listeners of romance at a glance we're so happy to have you if you'd like to support us further head over to patreon where you can become one of our patrons we've got a lot of great perks such as merch and a super secret discussion group where bridget and i talk to you directly about all things romance and all things nasty so come on over and now back to our show all right, all right. Tony, how did you feel about our dear 
heroin. We rate here one to five peach booties. <laughs> I gave her a five. She is a total badass. Ooh. I want to be her. <laughs> I loved her. I loved she was really smart like, and strong. And she was the only one who could kind of understand Dane's like thinking process, even though he, you know, he didn't have the maturity going on. So they had that balance. He was a mature in certain ways and she was mature in all ways. <laughs> and I just, I just love that. Um, it, it had to be her. It had to be somebody who was that strong in order to bring him down. And I don't, you know, I, and she was not intimidated and I don't like when people intimidate, she did what she had to do. She did it for family, her brother. And then when they got married, she did what she had to do, beat somebody up for him. So I love that. I, I, I feel like that's her. a very accurate description. Like she did what she had to do. <laughs> like she had to get done, she did it. Um, yeah. I agree with you completely. Jess for me was a five out the gate and she never lost any points for me. Like even when she was frustrated or, or something went wrong or, or that sort of thing, it all felt justified and you always saw her try to like assess a situation and grit and like get back on the horse and deal with that thing. Um, and her commitment to like the, to fucking with Dane, I, I loved, I loved that she was always like, <laughs> just like, like at the end of the book, you're like, I think Dane knows she's the superior being. He's like, yes, she's the superior being. <laughs> like, I just agree. Yeah. We're just going to agree with that. Um, but she was a firecracker right out the gate. And I like that she refused to pay Bertie's debt um, and also refused to get married to pay his debt. And he's like, oh, you just get married so you can pay for my gambling and other stuff, you know, that I've been doing with Dane or whatever. Um, and, and I like her plotting and stealing and her taking in the son and really making him part of the family and saying like, yes, I'd love to start my family with an eight-year-old son. And I was just like, that's, that's, that's big. That's big of you, girl. That's big of you. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So how did you feel about Dane, our hero? I guess, so I like to round up. <laughs> I'm going to give him a four because he was a proper jackass, but, but you know, you feel sorry for him because of his upbringing. Yeah. He didn't have the love that he needed, like everyone needs. So you, you feel sorry for him and you, you do see him change. So like I, I rounded up to a four. Nice. Very nice. So but, like, yeah. so here on the podcast, we round up too. If we ever get like a 3.5, like we just round. That's my thing. I'm like, if I, there's no point, there's no like point fives. So we, I just round up. Um, but uh, so I gave Dane, I thought about this for a while because I was between a four and a five. But I gave him a five because the one thing I want to see in my heroes or any of the characters really is growth, right? So wherever you start from is the baseline. And then wherever you end, you know, like is the, you know, the growth. And if there's enough growth, you can work your way to a five. Um, and I felt like Dane was the one. He was supposed to be a terrible, terrible character. And he started off as a terrible, terrible character. Um, and when he ends the book, he is a man who is ready to take care of his family. He's listening to his wife. He's dropping his ego. He's addressing his anxieties and concerns. He's providing for um, his son. He is emotionally available for them. Um, and he's vulnerable, which he started the book with none of that shit. <laughs> yeah. He was like none. morally bankrupt. He's a monster. So, so I felt like the growth of Dane, like he earned a five for me at the uh, end of the book. Um, and then I love the way he loves her at the, you know, at the end of the book. And also we didn't talk about this, but let me throw it back for a second because we're going to talk about how classy or nasty this book is. Like, how did the sex work for you in this book? Was it, was it working for you? Like, how'd you feel about it? I thought it was standard. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I thought about it. I'm like, because I know you guys do McDreamy, McSteamy, right? Yeah. Well, was, so, he, was like, he a McDreamy or McSteamy for you? I thought it was just more McDreamy. I thought everything they did as a couple was standard. I, and when he started speaking in Italian, even though he was talking about Parisian drainage, um, 
that did give it a, a little bit more romantic feel to it. Yeah. Um, I thought Jess was the more mixed teamy. I mean, she's the one who started their consummation. She initiated their cons- consummation. So. so did, so did. <laughs> yeah. A lot, not just even before that. So I, I don't know. I think, I think it was just more make dreamy to me. Yeah. Yeah. So I gave him a make steamy. Like, mm-hmm. because I kind of was like, well, the book is, I felt was very vanilla in terms of its uh, sex capades, but there was quite a bit of sex capades, which I liked. Like, I don't like, we don't like closed door here on this podcast. Let me tell you right now, <laughs> open the doors. Um, they had quite a bit of sex. They even had some outdoor sex, which I thought was like a lovely little addition um, to it. Which is when Does that our- make things steamy? I maybe it's just me I thought that's just standard stuff <laughs> <laughs> you a freak Ooh, Tony isn't it Tony giving herself away Tony Sorry. you a freak <laughs> no actually honestly I just gave him a, I more gave him a uh, mixed steamy because I'm a big fan of dirty talk um and I like that he was talking to her in Italian because like uh, later on in the book he was uh saying shit and talking and I just felt like the overall vibe was less like when I think of a McDreamy, I think of a more home, down home type of boy, and I don't mm-hmm. really like. So he doesn't quite fit my McDreamy standard. Um, um, but but that's why I'm like McSteamy because like he wasn't. I don't feel like he was all the way a McSteamy, but he wasn't uh, all the way a McDreamy either. So it's like yeah, it was middle. He was in the middle <laughs> somewhere, you know, a Mc Cloud Vapor. I don't know, but. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. Um, but that's how I felt. And uh, so there's quite a bit of sex in the book. I think the sex actively moves the book forward, which is how good sex scenes are supposed to um, be in romance novels. I didn't think there were necessarily anything to write home about, but they're solid. I felt like they were solid sex scenes. Um, and I mean, sex scenes can always get freakier for me um, in general. Like unless that, except for L.J. Shen, she writes some of the freakiest little like sex scenes and the nicest dirty talk. Um, so much so that the contemporary. I even, that's contemporary. And like okay. I don't read a lot, I don't read a lot of contemporary, but we read one of her books and that shit was hot. Hot as fuck. Uh I like the story itself was like whatever, but I didn't care because I was like, she put so much fucking sex in that book. I was just like, yes, turn page. <laughs> yes, yes, turn page more. <laughs> They're really well done and really good dirty talk. And that's my steez. So, um, but anyways, so I definitely felt like uh, the sex was good in this book. Um, there was one sex scene. I can't remember what, but it was hot. I was like, Ooh, that's kind of hot. Um, so yeah. So if you, if you like that kind of thing, you like a little, <laughs> little open door situation, uh, check out this book. Um, okay. So next we do our favorite lines in the book. Sometimes Bridget picks two, three, 10, I don't know how many she's ever, mm-hmm. she, she always picks however many she wants. Um, so you can do as many lines as you want, honestly. <laughs> so what was your favorite line? So they say it you know, like in different times in the book and it's basically, and they both say it. Yeah. The line is, I should like to see you try. So they <laughs> both say it to each other. So just, they're just goading each other and they're just, they just want to win whatever battle they can for whatever war that they have. And I love it. I believe uh, Jess says it in the cafe. Mm-hmm. He's, he's like, I'm going to ruin your reputation. He's like, go ahead and try. And then she starts apologizing because I'm sorry for ruining your reputation. Everybody knows you're romantic now because you're talking to me in Italian. <laughs> And then I, th- I believe later on, um, oh, that's a great scene. By the way. That scene. was a great. That was good. And again, you have to remember that you're in Paris. You're in the city of love. So certain things are different in Paris than it would be if they were in London. Yeah. If she was in London, she would be ruined. Yeah. If she was in Paris, like they have crimes of passion, you can get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> Which she did. Yeah. <laughs> but she did, and it made the story go in a certain way and, and it just gave it a certain ambiance it also told, that it made it work the fact that she shot him to the point that his arm didn't work anymore and he was like i must have this woman it gives you a real feel for his yeah. drive for her like 
you know. She's worth it. Like, there's something so odd that I love about this lady. Yes. No, um, I love it. So my favorite uh, quotes I actually already said uh, during the, while we were talking, but um, I will tell you my favorite review. And this is from Amanda who rated it five stars. Um, I just, I honestly picked this review because it was short. Every other review that I found was so long that I was like, ah, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to read the short one. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is still my favorite historical romance after so many years. The rereading can still make me laugh so hard throughout the book. I'm in love with both the characters. The hero and heroine are unique characters and so refreshing. They are not stereotypical of a reform rake and a blushing virgin. I can't get enough of Dane and Jessica, um, which I also thought. I, this book came so highly recommended. I mean, so many people told us this was the book to read um, and gave it five stars. And it has four and a half stars on Goodreads out of so many. And for me, this book just gets stars because it is not typical. It's like you take all yes. these things, all these ingredients that everybody has to work with and you write a story that go every, at every turn goes against what you think is going to happen. And it doesn't make contrived drama out of nothing. Every piece of drama made sense to me and it didn't get uh, dragged out too long. Like the whole charity in them situation, once they kind of figure out what's going on, they're like, okay, well, let's just fix this. And bada bing, boof, <laughs> then they fix it. Um, so I found it to be uh, not typical at all. Um, and so that was cool. No, exactly. I agree with that. Um, and then for me, and I do agree, like there was a lot of really long reviews, nothing wrong with that. But it was so hard to choose. I tried going to like three star ones and reading them. I'm like, this is not what I want to say. Like I, they deserve at least like a four star review for me to read. But I ended up choosing... Um, a five-star review from Chris Reed's Romance because I like the last line, but I'm going to say the first and the last line of her review. Cool. So she said, Ooh, the perfect blend of angst and witty banter had me from the get-go, friends. Lord of Scoundrels is definitely one I will revisit again and again when I need to laugh, cry, scream, and swoon. And I love that because like, who didn't scream when Dane got shot? <laughs> it was amazing and you said earlier like it, you don't expect it and that's why it's such a like, such a beloved historical romance yep I totally <laughs> so so many times did I pause the book and go like oh like you know <laughs> did that like, happen what? did that like, really did happen? That happen or like <laughs> rewind because I'm like did wait did she just say what I think she said or so many times, like I was actually listening to the book um, while my partner was sitting next to me working and I would like laugh out loud and like distract him, you know, and <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know, man, it's taken a lot for me to like laugh out loud at a book lately. Like when I was younger, I used to laugh out loud all the time, but I think over time you start hearing the same stories over and over again, you're not getting anything fresh and new. So there's not anything that makes you laugh out loud. So I always say if a book can make me laugh out loud, I'll give it five stars. So I gave this book five stars because I laughed out loud a whole lot while reading this book. Also, like I was probably between a four and a five. Like I was like 4.5. And then, uh, but I always round up. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to agree with the people who told me that this was a good read. This, this book was a refreshing read, hands down for me. How about you? No, I agree. I gave it a five also, like just by its entertainment value. You know, there's like a lot of funny dialogues, like I said earlier, Birdie and whoever. And then, of course, Dane and Jess. Um, and there's a lot of surprises. You don't expect like a Cunnilingus watch, you know, like, what is that? Like, <laughs> I've never heard of that. I want one because um, it's so funny. And then yeah, they're shooting too. and then there's a fight. And that's just only coming from Jess, you know, we don't, that's not even stuff like the hero is doing. So just by, and you said earlier, like, if you can laugh out loud, then it's automatically like top stars. And that's how I am too. I, I read this a second time, like at night and I, I had to like remind myself to stop like 
stop laughing because it's midnight and there's <laughs> people like sleeping. And it's, it's really good, like because you just don't expect certain things. And I love that. I love it's different. Um, in what was different to it, what I liked is she in the story the author brought in the whole like lawsuit thing for da- defamation. That's different. She as a woman looked at certain things as a different way to get satisfaction. And instead of dueling, which they would have done, you have a lawsuit. So I like that was different for the story also. Yeah. It kind of shows like, it shows their brains and their brawn and they both have those things. And it's just watching two people who match each other very well try to like just, just come together and make or show their love or whatnot. But yeah, yeah. in the end, like it really did take a strong beauty to soften the forceful beast. And I love this. And I, I like Beauty and the Beast retailing. So I like this even more because of that. Yes. Okay. So uh, Bridget and yeah. I have this, have this debate. So I'm going to ask you this question. Um, when you mm-hmm. watch Beauty and the Beast, the Disney one, the cartoon one, when the beast turns back into a prince, how did you feel about it? Back into a prince? Yeah, like Why? when he turns human. When he turns, hum- when he turns supposed hu- to. When he turns human again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll tell you. So, so Bridget and I both think uh, we're both very upset when he turns back human again uh, as kids. <laughs> because, like, you fall in love with the beast in the story, and then he turns into a very unattractive prince to us. Like, we're like, no, we <laughs> put him back. We like our beast. We like our beast men. <laughs> <laughs> did you like the the physique that he had as the beast is that what it is i think it's the because he, he looks scrawny like when he turned back to a human he does not only that but he's blonde he comes back blonde you know <laughs> and blonde just has a different feel for me than like the dark hair of the beast you mm-hmm. know what i'm saying like the energy the physique all of it it just he just turned into like a regular ass dude <laughs> <laughs> the beast was interesting and the, who was brad who was this like they tur- that's what happened he turned into brad and we're like oh man we don't want brad, turned into brad. That's <laughs> nobody wants brad who wants brad <laughs> <laughs> i've so never I- heard of that that's so good like i've never heard somebody like want the beast instead of the guy <laughs> We want the beast. I can't wait for fantasy uh, for our next season when we do fantasy and we get rage beasts. Oh my God. That's catnip. Catnip. I'm going <laughs> to ask people now, like, okay, remember Disney, the cartoon, Beauty and the Beast? What do you think about the beast and the guy? <laughs> the funny thing is, too, is like, there's a theme because when I think about. I'd rather have the beast. Oh, Wendy just told me she wants the beast instead. See, Wendy and the knows. Guy. What... Exactly. Wendy knows. <laughs> the panty. Cause, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna use a scrawny. I see you scrawny. I understand. I like 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 we said at the beginning of this episode. We like somebody who did we say at the beginning? Can lift episode? us. We like a guy who can lift us up. Yes, our 150 pound plus self. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> women have curves and thunder thighs. Lift us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like I've never been I mean I don't think I'm a giantess of a woman but I'm like somewhere between 5'7 five, 5'8 five, and definitely 155 plus I think right now I weigh like 165 um but probably at my heaviest I was like 190 or whatever and sometimes you have like boyfriends I remember I had a boyfriend he was kind of shorter a little smaller than me but he was kind of he was built right so he was shorter than me but he was built he could lift me and I was like I accept like, oh, wow. okay, you know, yeah. but then, <laughs> then I had this guy who was like six foot six and very skinny. And when he would lift me, he would sound like he was lifting a Mack truck and he would just, <laughs> he'd be wobbly on his legs and shit. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this. If you can't lift me, put me up on this wall right now. If, if you, if I'm dangling <laughs> off the side of a cliff and you can't one handed lift me back on <laughs> <laughs> into safety like we we can't get down like we, we just can't we can't <laughs> we're not a match i'm sorry we're not, we're not a match you're fired <laughs> you're fired <laughs> like that's that's just how i feel i don't have like necessary physical specs like you must look like this or that or whatever but you must be able to save my life 
if I need you to save my life off the side of my exactly. Life. exactly exactly I had this I have a six foot tall friend and he's the same way as me like we need somebody who can be able to like beat up somebody for us and protect <laughs> us and and still carry him and I'm like you're six foot you want a guy who's like like taller or just stronger than you? Like he just needs to lift me up, he just, he just <laughs> or needs to like at least carry, or he needs to at least be able to like beat up somebody. Am I yeah. okay? So at least I mean we understand each other. We like to be protected. <laughs> so I understand cool. now. Like they are saying, you want the beast, yeah, the scrawny guy, then the Brad. Then okay. Brad. Nobody wants Brad. Yeah, you know, Wendy don't want Brad. <laughs> Nobody wants. <Brad. laughs> yeah, unless he's Brad Pitt. I don't, I don't even want Brad Pitt, man. Like, I like Brad no. Pitt. Legends, <laughs> like, only Legends of the Fall. Brad legends Pitt of the Fall. <laughs> was, I, was I down for? But, like, this whole Brangelina Brad Pitt, like, I don't know. He's the, he not doing it for me anymore. <laughs> anymore. Yeah, the younger you know? Brad Pitt. But I do find the older I get, the more, and I think this is my lizard brain. Hands down, my lizard brain is taken over because my body's trying to get me pregnant. And, like... <laughs> the more I want like a guy who can grow a full beard and I know he has testosterone and he's got big arms that I know he could punch somebody with and who he can protect me if I need to, to fight somebody. And like, I had these, like a couple instances happen where I was with my guy friends and all of them were like, pussy ass bitches, things happen. And they were like, well, what do you want us to do? And I was like, I want you to punch that fool in the face. (laughs) You know? And after that, like I had this one guy, a random guy come up and put his hand all the way back up in my fro and grab it. I didn't know this guy from anyone. And like my friends were there and I had a friend go like, oh, no, he didn't. But that's like literally the extent of all that was said. And I was like, what the hell, man? Like, you just got like, you know. Yeah, do something. (laughs) Yeah. And it was so weird for me because like my friends when I was younger, they would bow up. They would fight for you. Like if some shit went down. And now I have this like set of adult male friends that are just like, Oh, pussy ass bitches. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. I, I don't sign up. I might get a I might get a lawsuit. <laughs> I'm just like bow up. Like I actually had to bow up in that situation, which I can. Gosh. Uh, but like I you want your friends to come to bat for you. My girlfriends would have came to bat for me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it was just definitely interesting. And the more the older I get, the more I'm like, if my partner won't fight for me, like physically throw down for me, I'm like, I kind of don't want it. Like, I'm kind of, you know, like, yeah. you won't have to do something. You at least have to have a big enough pocketbook to pay somebody to throw down for me. And at least, I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. Um, but no, so I I'm gonna, the same way. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up and say that we both agree that this is worth the read for the five yes. stars. Um, and this has been a pleasure uh, doing this podcast with you. Um, I'll never forget it because this is my first one. Um, having a, a co-host who's not Bridget, um, and it was fabulous. Uh, and I loved hearing uh, Wendy's commentary from the back, <laughs> which it might be funny because I actually might be at Bridget's when we do the other crossover episode. So mm-hmm. uh, look out for that, dear listeners. Um, so I might be the voice in the back going, Bridget, <laughs> say this, <laughs> say this, <laughs> which I think is welcome. So, uh, all right, dear listeners, thank you for hanging out with us. Tony, you have been marvelous and great, and we will catch you you. next time. Uh, So until then, may your books be your lover. And your hand your best friend. Hey, nailed it. Thanks for hanging in with us, romance readers. Head over to Instagram to continue chatting with us. We're super friendly. We want to cackle with you. We want to know what your favorite sex scene was. And we need more book recommendations. If you want to read along with us, go to our website, romanceataglance.com, to see what we're reading next. And we'll see you next podcast. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to our channel to get new episodes, clips, and more. And click here to watch our previous reviews and author interviews.